Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome all of you to our next session of the APDR National Virtual Noon Conference. My name is uh, Dr. Hart Beatty. I'm the uh, chair of the Education Committee for the APDR and the Neural Radiology Fellowship Director at Boston Medical Center. Again, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's session. Um, I'll just get to introducing the speakers in a moment. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, as you all know, we are recording today's session and it will be hosted on the APDR YouTube channel. Um, in addition to recording the session, we are also recording all the questions and comments. Um, and if you are going to ask comments, uh, I'm sorry, if you are gonna ask questions, we ask that you use the Zoom tool for your questions and our speakers will either try to answer them at the end of their sessions or uh, email you answers um, at a later time. Uh, you also should know that uh, your microphones are being muted to ensure optimal quality uh, during the webinar. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two amazing speakers for today, uh, Dr. Yvonne Chung and Dr. Brang Amini. Dr. Chung uh, will uh, be speaking about ankle tendons and update. She's from Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. And we're grateful to have Dr. Amini um, from MD Anderson Cancer Center, uh, Associate Professor, and he'll be speaking on spine stereotactic radiosurgery, what the clinician needs from your report. So again, we are so grateful for both speakers. And without further ado, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll ask Dr. Chung to take over the screen share and unmute yourself. All right, hello everyone. This is Yvonne Chung from Dartmouth. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today and a special thanks to Dr. Beatty for organizing these wonderful educational opportunities. My talk is on imaging of ankle tendons and update. Let me get my uh, laser pointer here. Okay, so we will review the anatomy that is relevant to imaging of tendons. I will show cases of common tendon injuries. The updates will be on tendon injuries in hind foot fractures. We will also discuss soft tissue injuries around the medial arch in cases of acquired flat foot deformity. My talk will concentrate on MR and CD imaging with the understanding that ultrasound plays an important role in the diagnosis of tendon injuries. Tendon disorders are commonly arise from overuse, exacerbated by age-related degeneration and vascularity. Several common medications and systemic disease also increase risk of tendon injury. For example, gout, inflammatory arthropathy, diabetes, and renal failure are linked to tendon injuries. This is an example of Achilles tendinopathy in a patient with gout. The diffusely thick Achilles containing calcifications can be seen on both. The diffusely thick Achilles tendon uh, can be seen on both MR and radiographs, and these are the calcifications on the X-ray. The terms that describe tendon injuries are confusing. In a recent meeting of experts, the preferred term is tendinopathy which is an umbrella term that includes a spectrum of changes found in patients with tendon dysfunction, meaning that tendon pain and loss of function. These experts did not agree what tendinosis refers to. The term tendonitis implies an inflammatory process. This term has been abandoned in the 1990s because at that time, inflammation was not consistently seen in ruptured tendons. Newer evidence, indicates that inflammation does accompany overuse injuries, but the experts are committed to the generalized term tendinopathy. All tendon have most of, if not all of these components, and we'll go through quickly on them. Tendons are pulleys that connect muscles to bone. And so to provide motion, joint motion, to ensure smooth guiding movement, tendons have specialized coverings. And there are two types of coverings. Tendon sheaths are well differentiated coverings at turns where there is increased friction. For example, when the perineal tendons descends 
you know, travels behind the lateral malleolus, they are covered by a common tendon sheath. And when the tendon travels in a straight path, they are covered by loose connective tissues called peritinon. The Achilles tendon is a prime example of such an arrangement. It travels in a straight path and is covered entirely by peritinon. This loose connective tissue covering reduces friction and provides vascularization for the tendon fibers. Retinaculums are fibrous bands that guide the tendon at turns. These form fibro-osseous tunnels or tight spaces where pathology frequently occurs. And these four components give rise to four common categories of tendon injuries. And these, the image, the uh, MR appearance are similar in these categories. And keep in mind that these are overlapping injuries that may occur in isolation or in combination. We will start with tendinopathy. Abnormal tendon has altered size, signal, and shape or morphology. And in this patient with a posterior tibial tendinopathy, the posterior tibial tendon is more than double the size of the adjacent flexor digitorum longus, uh, flexor digitorum longus tendon. The signal is also increased with by bright T PD and T2 weighted images. In this case of chronic Achilles tendinopathy, the size of the Achilles is increased with loss of anterior concavity, and it is completely devoid of signal on all sequences. When there is bright TT signal within the tendon, we call this tendon tear. This is the sagittal image of this partial tear. And please notice the rest of the Achilles is diffusely effect, indicating that this is an acute on chronic injury. This combination is very common in overuse uh, injuries. Full thickness there are the same everywhere with a full thickness defect in this Achilles tendon and the tendon defect is full of the fluid. Please notice that this hypointense rim does not represent a tendon sheath. It is a fibrotic paratenon forming a pseudo sheath. We'll see more of this later. And tenosynovitis refers to inflammation of the tendon sheath. And it is also the same everywhere. And tenositis in this case is represented by a rim of bright T2 signal. The bright signal represents any combinations of fluid or inflamed synovium. Contrast enhancement <clears throat> allows us to separate the non-enhancing fluid from the enhancing synovium. And you can see on the sagittal image how thick this synovium is. But peritendinous fluid is common among medial tendons, for example, in this uh, T2 weighted image. So this is a medial malleolus, lateral malleolus, the posterior tibial tendon. There is a small amount of bright T2 signal around these two tendons. A, in a recent study, a width of two millimeter or less is considered physiologic uh, in a study of healthy volunteers. Peritonitis refers to inflammation around a tendon without a sheath. In this case, the acutely inflamed parathenon around this thick Achilles tendon has enhancing T2 signal, indicating inflamed parathenon. And dislocation and subluxations are less common, and these are different. Uh, with different tendons, and I'll cover these under individual tendons. So we'll first go over abnormalities of the Achilles. The painful Achilles tendon is a common presentation in sports medicine clinic. Since Achilles travels in a straight path and is covered only by peritinon, so we only have to worry about tendinopathy, tears, and peritinonitis. There are two types of Achilles injuries the non-insertional tendinopathy occurs at mid-tendon between 2 and 7 cm above the insertion. It is more common. The insertional tendinopathy affects the distal 2 cm. A typical patient with non-insertional tendinopathy is a middle-aged male, weekend warrior. Overuse degeneration is a common feature in this type of tendon injury. The most common finding 
of non-insertional tendinopathy is a thick tendon, as in this patient who presents with a palpable mass. Both the radiography and MR can detect the thick Achilles tendon. And in here, there is also an interstitial tear. And the spectrum of tears ranges from interstitial tears in the normal size tendon, partial tear to complete interruption, where the torn ends are retracted. Peritonitis can be seen in any part of the Achilles tendon. A normal peritinon is isointense or inseparable from fat. The inflamed peritinon has bright T2 signal, you can see on both axial and sagittal images. And in one study, pain corresponds to the focus of bright T2 signal in the peritinon. In chronic cases, the fibrotic peritinon forms a pseudo sheath, which is more easily detected when the tendon is interrupted and there is fluid at the gap, as in this case of partial tear. And this peritinon is really thick in this case of a complete tear. Insertional tendinopathy is seen in the distal 2CM of the tendon and in and on x-ray, we frequently see a diffusely thick tendon. And there are a company enthesivites or stirs or calcifications within the tendon substance. The MRI shows similar findings with a thick distal tendon with longitudinal splits. Reactive marrow edema is seen in both the tendon ossification and also the calcaneal tuberosity and retro calcaneobasitis represented by this bright T2 signal is another pain generator. And in a resection of the posterior bony prominence, or this is called the bursal projection, it's offered in some cases of failed conservative treatment, and this is calcaneoplasty. So we'll move on to perineal tendons. The perineal tendons are mostly covered by tendon sheath and bound by retinaculi. So tenosynovitis, tendinopathy and tears and subluxations are common. Many of these lesions occur behind the lateral malleolus because the tendons turn in a tight fibrooseous tunnel created by the superior peroneal retinaculum. We all know that mechanical wear is common at turns and tunnels. These injuries include perineal brevis splits, tendinopathy, tumorous enlargement, and two types of subluxation. Perineal splits occur behind the fibular groove because the tendon is constantly being pushed against the bone. These splits are common and is reported up to a third of cadavers. Splits can be asymptomatic, but splits in young patients are generally painful. Crowding a tunnel by anomalous muscles may predispose to tendon pathology. This is the perineus quartus, an anomalous muscle behind the lateral malleolus. This muscle slip travels with the perineal tendons and continues distally as a tiny tendon slip. This may cause crowding. And in this case, the perineus brevis has multiple longitudinal splits. But remember that not all perineus quartus are symptomatic. Overstuffing of the perineal tunnel predisposed to perineal tendon pathology. And a prominent perineus brevis muscle belly is seen here in the tunnel. The muscle is considered low-lying when it ends distal to the lateral malleolus. And in this case, a perineal split is seen. Overuse degeneration may lead to tendon enlargement or tumorous enlargement on this axial image of the perineal tendon. So this is the longest and that's the brevis, which is big, and there is tenosynovitis. On the sagittal image, the nodular perineal tendon is trapped inferior to the lateral malleolus, resulting in restricted tendon motion. Longest injuries can occur at multiple locations because the tendon makes several turns and travels under several tunnels. And these are located in behind the lateral malleolus, 
underneath the perineal tubercle, which is a calcaneal bony projection that separates the brevis from the longest, and also beneath the cuboid when it turns underneath. And the, but the most common location is between the perineal tubercle and the cuboid. And this is an example of tendon injury at this zone. So again, a coronal image of the calcaneus, and this is the calcaneal projection of the perineal tubercle. And the perineus longest tendon has multiple longitudinal splits surrounded by peritendinous fluid and inflammation. And the splits end uh, near the cuboid tunnel where the, the tendon remains thick and heterogeneous. Also at the lateral malleolus, the superior peren perineal retinaculum covers the perineal tendons and keep them from behind the fibular groove. A torn or stripped retinaculum allows the tendon to sublex. And in this case, the perineus longus sublex into the pouch formed by a stripped superior peroneal retinaculum. And most subluxations are sports related injuries. And there is also a classification for this type of injury. A variation of subluxation is the intrasheath subluxation. This injury is characterized by an intact superior peroneal retinaculum, but the, and there is reversal of the usual arrangement between the brevis and the longus. So this is normal when the brevis is behind the fibula. So when there is subluxation, the longus is behind the fibula. Ultrasound is best for making this diagnosis because of its dynamic capability. But I'm showing you an example of this reverse arrangement on MRI. So the tendon closest to the fibula, when we stroll down, proved to be the perineus longus because it sits underneath the perineal tubercle. So this is intersheath subluxation. And so we move on to some updates. Uh, first, I'll talk about tendon injuries in hind foot fractures. A recent study indicated that up to 18% of hind foot fractures have associated tendon injuries on CT examination. But only 20% of tendon injuries were reported. So that means that we are not looking. And these are the type of tendon injuries that were reported in a series of 400 patients. And these include entrapment, subluxation, and tendon rupture. And the breakdown of the fracture type and the tendon injury show the, these associations. But we don't need to memorize this because any tendon can be injured. And our job is just to check on all tendons. And so the tendons are visible on CT because they have a slightly higher density than surrounding muscles. The average density is 90 Hangzhou units. So this is the Achilles, the perineal tendons, the posterior tip, and the flexor tendons. And in this case of a pylon fracture with a big anterior displaced fragment, and we scroll distally and you follow the posterior tibial tendon, it just go on and it fell into the the bony defect. And here it's almost completely encircled by the uh, frag bone fragment. So this is posterior tibial entrapment in pylon fracture. So entrapment is defined as over 50% of the tendon circumference surrounded by bone fragments. So in this case of Taylor fracture, the bone fragment encircles almost the entire perineus brevis tendon, which is also dislocated. So this is the laromeliolus, the fibular groove, and this is the longus, and the brevis is sublex anteriorly, or dislocated, and the tendon is entrapped, compared to this case where the bone sliver only covers part of the, ten, the one of the perineal tendons. And in case of a calcaneal fracture, so you see a flattened bolus angle and everything, and we look at the CAT scan and we look, follow the, look for the tendons, so Achilles, medial tendons, and behind the lateral malleolus, the fibular groove is empty. So where are the peroneal tendons? And you can see it has dislocated anteriorly. 
and we can see the same thing on 3D models when we rotate. So this is an empty fibula groove. When we move forward, you have the perineus tendons coming out. And finally, we have the pylon fracture. And so what is in the crack? So we follow, we go down. So this is anterior tibial and we go down and this is extensor, halus's longest tendon and it drops into the crack. The tendon is also impaled by this bone fragment. And so tendon injuries has to be described and communicated to the surgeon for proper preoperative planning. Here are the consequences of missed tendon injury early on and trapped tendons can lead to failed reduction. Late complications include chronic pain and instability. So finally, we'll talk about the medial support in flat foot deformity. So the posterior tibial tendon, the more common lesions include tendinopathy and tenosynovitis. The tendon has a very short segment of carotene or near its insertion, so it plays a lesser role. And this location is usually associated with acute fractures and will not be discussed here. So partial tears are the same everywhere. And in this case of the posterior tibial tendon is a normal size tendon with multiple longitudinal splits. So pay attention to this structure. This is the spring ligament deep to the posterior tibial tendon. And this partial tear, in this case, the tendon is thick with a longitudinal split. And then this, the, in this case, the tendons, the split tendons are bulbous and are displaced apart. And there is um, tenosynovitis in all cases. So a normal tendon, posterior tibial tendon, is double the size of the adjacent flexor digitorum longus tendon. The posterior tibial tendon is considered atten attenuated when it's the same size or less or smaller than the adjacent flexor tendon. Attenuated tendon is considered a partial tear. And full thickness tear are similar everywhere and you see the frayed torn end of the posterior tibial tendon on this coronal image, and this is the medial malleolus. But you have to pay attention to the medial supporting ligaments, which we'll go into detail later. And in chronic posterior tibial dysfunction, hypertrophic spurs and cortical irregularity develop at the medial malleolus. The corresponding MR images show a posterior tibial partial tear surrounded by the spur that has reactive marrow signal alteration and of course, tenosynovitis. Posterior tibial tendon is the primary but not the only stabilizer of the medial tendon. So if you torn the posterior tendon, it does not mean that you automatically get a flat foot deformity because Cadaveric studies show that even when you cut out the posterior tendon, not all of them, not all feet, they're not, not, we don't encounter flat foot deformity every time. And more recent work recognizes failure of multiple stabilizers to produce flat form deformity. This is really busy slide and it just shows you the different stages of tendon and ligament injury. So initially, the posterior tibial tendon has tendinopathy or partial tear. And then when more ligaments, such as the spring ligament, sinus tarsi ligament, plantar fascia happens, then we get a flexible flat foot deformity. Rigid deformity occurs with injury to the deltoid ligament and osteoarthritis and lateral impingement. And then final stage is a heel valgus with fixed flat foot deformity and when more ligament and more sites of osteoarthropathy. This is a very nice uh, diagram from Mangiardi's article. So it shows you the posterior tibial tendon coming down and deep to it are the secondary supporting soft tissues. So we take at the posterior and you see at this level, we have the superficial deltoid ligament that's continuous to the spring ligament, which connects the calcaneus to the navicular. And deep 
the deepest tendons are the strong deltoid ligaments. And other supports such as the plantar fascia uh, are not illustrated in that drawing. And so this is ML imaging. Uh, ML ligaments are well seen on MRI. So again, the deepest layer is the deep deltoid, which crosses only one joint. And then you have the superficial deltoid, which is past one joint and then another joint, okay? So this is superficial deltoid, and then you see the posterior tibial tendon, and it's also sandwiched, and it's also covered by the flexor retinaculum. And then the superficial deltoid continues into the spring ligament. Uh, so this reminds me of this layered kick. And then we'll look at the spring ligament in detail. So. It continues from the tibial spring ligament, and it's which is attached to the medial malleolus, and it has three components. You have the superior medial bundle, you have the medial plantar oblique, and the inferior bundle. Okay, and on MRI, you can see these. Okay, so again, medial malleolus, flexor retinaculum, and you have the tibial spring. And it continues into the superior medial component of the spring ligament. And it continues down, and this is a posterior dip. And then it goes to the medial and plantar oblique. And this is the most important bundle of the spring ligament, the superior medial uh, component. The best criteria for an insufficient spring ligament and is when the spring ligament is less than two millimeters. Some consider six millimeter abnormal, but using thickness as a criteria is, in, is unre unreliable because separating the posterior tibial tendon and this and the uh, superior medial spring ligament is frequently difficult. And there's also a layer of gliding zone there. So unless you have fluid surrounding the posterior tip, otherwise it's hard to separate these two structures. And you can see it is measured four millimeters. And so this is a case of flat foot deformity. The posterior tibial tendon is abnormal, so it's thick with tears. And then you can see the spring ligaments with a gap, and then the plantar components are thick because of retraction. And also notice the sinus tarsi, which is this laros, a cone-shaped space located in between the talus and calcaneus, and it contains ligaments that stabilize the hind foot. And so when the spring ligament and the posterior tibial tendon are injured, so this space is collapsed and is flattened and the ligaments in there are stretched and irregular. Another case of flat foot deformity, in this case, we, so I put the normal here for comparison. So the posterior tibial tendon is abnormal, so it's thick and irregular with tears. And then we see deep to that is the superior medial component of the spring ligament. And, but it's not connected to the medial malleolus to the tibial spring ligament. So this is tear of the superficial deltoid ligament. Another flat foot deformity, but this one has hind foot valgus. If that's a situation, in this situation, the lateral structures are being compressed, okay? So the sinus tarsi being compressed and the talus and calcaneus are being compressed. And you can see on this MRI with bony sclerosis developing at the angle of Gisand. And another, and in that case, the posterior tibial tendon is torn, right? It's just a, almost an empty sheath. And then this is the tibial spring ligament. The blue bracket is the gap in the posterior tibial tendon and the superior medial spring ligaments attenuated. And here you do see the uh, posterior subtalar joint osteoarthropathy and even the lateral malleolus impacted onto the lateral subtures. So we have reviewed the anatomy relevant to imaging and I've shown you cases of tendon injuries and keep in mind that the tendon abnormalities are pretty universal. It can be found in a lot of tendons. And finally, I've shown you uh, tendon injuries in hind foot fractures. So it is important for us to look for tendons in all those CT scans for fractures. And then I'll show, I have shown you the medial supporting ligaments associated with flat foot deformity. Thank you very much. You can please send me all your 
questions? Thank you so much. We really appreciate such a wonderful lecture. Um, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Amini, to share your screen and begin your presentation. All right, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, honored to be here on this pandemic-inspired meeting. Um, all right, let me go back actually to the beginning. That, that might help. So when I was in residency, I used to joke that my nightmare practice would be um, mammogram, PD, ICU, chest, and post-operative spine. And um, that is uh, one third of that unfortunately came true, but it's not as scary as, um, as I used to think. And I'm hoping to help you um, a little bit with your anxiety when you see these um, uh, metastatic spines, maybe with hardware, maybe um, uh, before surgery. Um, the focus of this one is going to be um, the radiosurgery treatment. And I'll uh, talk about it a little bit in the beginning and then I'll show you some cases and examples. All right. Oops. There we go. All right, so the objective, we're gonna review radiation therapeutic modalities available for spine mats, um, indications for spine stereotactic radiotherapy, and this is distinct from just conventional external beam radiotherapy, and we'll get into that. Um, review, review your role as radiologist and some pitfalls that you can uh, run into, and then let's, uh, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on an adjunct procedure that's been, um, I don't know if it's been developed here, but um, it's been definitely, um, I, I don't wanna, to our horn, but it's been uh, perfected here by one of our neurosurgeons. Um, it's mostly an IR procedure, so hopefully when you guys finish and get into your practices, you can uh, try to wrestle this away from neurosurgery, uh, but we'll see. All right, so spine metastases. Uh, we know what they are. Um, there's some text here, but I think the important thing is we're getting, um, because of our improvements in chemo, immunotherapy, and things like that, our patients with stage four cancer are living much longer. So durability of local control with spine meds uh, is super important because uh, it can really impact patient's life and uh, just qu uh, quality of life, actually. So let's just talk about the different uh, modalities for radiosurgery. We, we kind of, uh, radiotherapy, we kind of lump these all together, um, but there's uh, distinct differences. Um, and the difference basically comes down to how you're shaping your beam. So we go from least um, complicated to most complicated here. And you can see, um, the uh, 3D conformal, you basically have beams coming from different directions and they kind of converge and give you ablation of the tumor. When you have IMRT or intensity modulated, they put these filters and sometimes these filters are just like these very simple metal bars, um, kind of like the wedge filters we see for foot x-rays and things like that. And they shape the beam so that you get a little bit better um, uh, confirmation to the, uh, to the tumor while sp uh, sparing areas of um, sensitive tissue. For example, um, GI or, um, or um, uh, yeah, I guess GI tract and uh, spinal cord in our case. And then uh, finally, we have the most advanced, which is um, very familiar to you in the brain as gamma knife, but it's been developed for, uh, for lung, body, and now spine. And this goes under the various names, SBRT, stereotactic body, body radiotherapy, stereotactic spine radiosurgery, and the familiar gamma knife. And um, SSRS, as I'll refer to here, basically takes a lesion in the spine and then you basically attack it from all fronts with the hope of um, eliminating a toxicity to the spinal cord. Usually it's between one and three fractions as opposed to conventional external beam radiotherapy, which is, um, can be as anywhere as uh, 10, 20 uh, fractions. And um, the single fraction gives you the highest biological dose. And this will become important when we talk about pseudoprogression. Um, some terms that you may have run into or you will run into when dealing with stereotactic radiosurgery is GTV and CTV. GTV is the gross tumor volume, and this is basically the tumor that's visible on imaging. And then CTV is clinical tumor volume, which is kind of the area at risk for contiguous um, spread for tumors. So they treat, uh, depending on the institution, um, you may treat the GTV to a higher dose than the CTV. And that, again, helps you conform your beam uh, in such a way as to eliminate injury to the spinal cord, in this case, the esophagus as well. And you can see these isodose lines here, the highest dose, 24 gray in this case, is being delivered to the tumor, and then it drops off as you, uh, as you go down. And just uh, look how well this beam is uh, shaped to avoid injuring the spinal cord. Um, the strengths of SSRS is that it can significantly reduce the dose of the spinal cord and GI tract uh, con uh, compared to IMRT and conventional external, uh, other conventional external beam techniques. Um, in long-term cancer survivors, those surviving then, uh, greater than five years, we have 80% local control rates. And this chain uh, varies depending on the tumor type, but that is, uh, that is excellent local control. And it's quick, so you don't have to interrupt your chemotherapy. 
And um, this is um, in uh, contrast to surgery, which is usually the alternative for these. And then a reduced mor morbidity as well associated with the SSRS. So this is a very complicated uh, flow diagram for how to pick stereotactic radiosurgery versus, versus other uh, conventional external beam radiotherapy. So I'll just take it one, at a, uh, one section at a time. So neurologic, we uh, consider how much epidural spinal cord compression there is, ESCC, and whether there's myelopathy or not. And um, this is a, a figure you should be very familiar with if you're doing any of these tumor um, uh, studies. The, um, this is the Bilski classification for epidural spinal cord compression and basically looks at how much epidural disease there is um, in relation to the spinal cord. And I'll tell you why this is important in a second. Um, so zero is basically tumor uh, confined to bone. One A is confined to the epidural space, but not indenting the thecal sac. One B is indenting the thecal sac, but not touching the spinal cord. And one C is touching the spinal cord. Once you get past 1C, you're dealing with cord compression. Uh, two is um, compressing the cord, but you still have CSF. And three is compressing the, uh, the spinal cord and the CSF is completely gone. And uh, just the, this image here is a reminder that this is defined for the spinal cord, but we kind of use it also with the cauda. Uh, you have to kind of use your imagination with this. Basically, CSF is gone, you call it a three. If there's CSF left, you call it a, a two. Uh, so why is this important? So the low grade is basically zero to one B, meaning not touching the cord within two millimeters. And uh, this two millimeters is important because when you're doing stereotactic radiosurgery, you wanna basically focus your beam um, on the tumor and then uh, and not injure the spinal cord. And you need about a two millimeter window so that your dose drop off doesn't injure the cord. And then high grade is basically one C to three, you're touching the cord, there's no way you're gonna uh, conform your beam to the tumor without uh, injuring the spinal cord. The next concept, and we're going to come back a little bit into um, the spinal cord compression, but first I want to talk about radiosensitivity. This is another concept that you should be familiar with. Um, and the sensitivity is based on response to conventional external beam uh, radiotherapy. And this is where stereotactic radiosurgery comes in because you can deliver higher doses and get past this radiosensitivity issue. So what are some radiosensitive histologies? Lymphoma, seminoma, myeloma, these are these tumors where you can give relatively low doses and the tumors just kind of melt away. Um, breast and prostate are also in this um, category, although you have to give a little bit higher doses compared to um, lymphoma and myeloma, and uh, they respond fairly well to conventional external beam. Almost everything else, you start getting into this um, radiosensitive territory, especially sarcomas and renal cell carcinomas. These are, are tumors where you need to deliver very high doses uh, if you have any hope of uh, killing the tumor. Um, and those high doses you really can't deliver with uh, conventional external beam. So let's get back to the epidural spinal cord compression. We talked about how if there's one C or higher disease, you can't really do stereotactic radiosurgery because the dose drop off is not gonna be rapid enough for you to avoid um, injuring the cord. And that's where separation surgery comes in. This surgery separates the tumor from the spinal cord. It's not meant to do a complete debulking of the tumor. It's not meant to get rid of disease. It's just meant to help the radiation oncologist get in there and treat the actual tumor, relieve spinal cord compression, um, and things like that. So basically it turns a 1C to 3 epidural disease into 1B or lower, and then lets the stereotactic radiosurgery happen. And um, unfortunately, like all surgery requires interruption of chemo for several weeks. So if you have a patient who has a rapidly developing malignancy and um, that, that can be kind of a, um, a problem for them. You don't want to interrupt chemo, but you don't want to start chemo too fast because then it'll interfere with um, healing after surgery. Um, this laser interstitial thermal therapy or LIT as an alternative option. Um, I'll briefly talk about it. Uh, it's, it's um, you know, you can give a talk about this topic all by yourself, by itself. Uh, Dr. Claudio Tatsui is one of our neurosurgeons here and he's basically pioneered its use in our institution and has a lot of publications on this. So if you guys wanna learn more about how it's done, uh, look up his name in PubMed. So this is the tumor that's touching the spinal cord. This is the problematic area, right? You can't do a stereotactic radiosurgery um, to this tumor without injuring the spinal cord. So what you do is you come in, uh, this patient's upside down and you um, ablate the tumor and it's done under MR guidance um, with diffusion weighted imaging, helping to um, control the spinal cord, uh, the, the dose delivered to the tumor. And as soon as the temperature hits at um, a target level, it stops. So 
very minimal damage to adjacent structures. One thing we have um, found is that this is ideal for the thoracic spine, not great for the C-spine just because the structures are much tighter and not great in the L-spine because um, you have a, no matter how, uh, how much you try to modulate, you still end up injuring the cauda. So it's mostly a T-spine uh, thing. This is an image from the earlier manufacturer um, literature showing um, the L-spine before we knew this. Um, it's, a, it's a pain to do, so that's probably why none of the radiologists want to do it, but it's um, multiple steps, first under fluoro, then under uh, MR guidance. And this is some images. Um, this is an image from the um, temperature control just showing how that's done. And this is the end result. So this is a patient with RCC, obviously not amenable to um, conventional external beam because it's a um, radio-resistant histology. So this is before and this is after. So we went from Bilski 2 touching the cord, uh, CSF showing a little bit to basically a grade zero where it's confined to the bone. And then now the radiation oncologist can come in and contour this very nicely and um, uh, improve local control for this patient. So um, kind of hit on these during the, um, during the talk. Um, Next, we're going to talk about stability. And this is um, basically if the spine is unstable, you want to do some stabilization prior to radiation uh, therapy. And the um, surgeons and radiation oncologists use the SIN score, Spinal Instability Neoplastic Score. And I'm just going to, I'm not going to go through everything. I just want to highlight that out of the different components of this lesion, all but one are imaging criteria. So this is where you need to come in and help them out with this um, by either describing it or actually helping them out by giving them the, the score. So stable is zero to six, potentially unstable is seven to 12, and unstable is greater than 12. And this is where you, uh, the surgeons come in and stabilize before doing any um, additional therapy. And then um, the systemic, you always need to consider this uh, when you're treating your patients. If the patient doesn't have a long-term survival um, chance, then it's really uh, kind of futile to come in and do a bunch of stuff on it, on the patient that's going to um, adversely affect their quality of life in their last few weeks or months. Uh, tumor biology is important, um, any comorbidities, obviously. And this is where, again, you come in as radiologists, um, oligometastatic or oligoprogressive. If the patient has a bunch of METs that are responding to chemotherapy but has one or two sites that are progressing, this is when uh, you can come in, come in with stereotactic radiosurgery, um, zap those um, in isolation, and then return the patient to just uh, getting chemo as opposed to changing chemo just because two of the lesions are progressing. And different institutions have different definitions of oligo. It's usually less than five, but you know you can make exceptions if the, um, some of the lesions are close to each other and you can treat them together. So what's your role? You need to describe the extent of disease, get the levels right. Um, a lot of times um, we catch these long, uh, sorry, wrong level um, identifications in our multidisciplinary conferences. Uh, what they do is they fuse their CT and MRI for planning. Now we have MR Linux, where they can just do the everything on the MR, but a lot of places are still using the CT for radiation planning. Use annotations, uh, describe extent of epidural disease and soft tissue disease, because they'll have to uh, cover every site of disease to avoid cutting through tumor. And um, this um, also becomes important when adjacent levels are involved. Findings that would disqualify patients for stereotactic radiosurgery are LMD, intradural extension and greater than uh, three vertebral levels. And this is, again, um, kind of a rough um, uh, cutoff, but if it's greater than that, then it, it just becomes too difficult to plan for stereotactic and they go with external beam. So obviously if there's transitional anatomy, you wanna make sure everyone's on, on the same page. You don't wanna go back and forth between, oh crap, was this L1 or was it at T12? So just make sure everyone's on, on the same page if there's transitional anatomy. You want to describe that completely so the um, radiation oncologists know what's happening. And then um, annotations, they find it very helpful to describe um, things that are in the report, but you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. And um, I often go in and put arrows on them just to help them with their radiation planning. It saves a, a phone call and uh, uh, you know, makes, uh, add, adds value to your report. And then adjacent level is important. So here's a patient with a MET at T7 with epidural disease. And then you can uh, see the adjacent level involvement at the um, superior facet of, um, of T, uh, T8 here and um, also inferior T6. And it can be very hard to differentiate between epidural disease and venous plexus. Usually venous plexus is a little bit higher um, uh, signal on post-contrast images, but not always. Again, note adjacent level involvement. <clears throat> 
and CT can be helpful. Sometimes MR doesn't really show you the full extent of bone destruction, and you can use CT to your advantage. And a lot of times I actually fuse the PET images with this stuff as well, um, just, just to give you a little bit more insight into where the disease is. So that's um, one um, way your extent needs to be def defined. Another way is how much of the cord, uh, how much of the vertebral body is involved, or uh, the vertebral body and posterior elements. Um, this may seem a little complicated and uh, tedious and unnecessary, but I'll explain how this is helpful. Um, the GTV, as we said, is the area that they, um, they blast with the higher dose, and CTV is the at-risk area. Um, these diagrams here define what the at-risk area is and help them plan their CTV. So let me just explain. If any portion of the vertebral body is involved by tumor, the CTV needs to cover the entire vertebral body. If it's lateralized in the vertebral body, meaning on the right or left, you cover the entire vertebral body plus the ipsilateral pedicle and transverse process. If it's diffuse vertebral body involvement, you cover the entire vertebral body, obviously, and then your CTV extends to cover the pedicles and transverse processes bilaterally. If it's a vertebral body plus one pedicle, you do the entire vertebral body, ipsilateral pedicle transverse process and lamina, and uh, so forth. I, I just I won't read everything, but you get the picture. It's not just um, what's, uh, you just don't say there's a met in the, at T12 and leave it at that. You want to describe where it's going because if you're starting to get into the contralateral lamina, for example, that's important because now they have to cover the um, contralateral side of the um, transverse process and pedicle. All right, so here's an example where you think, okay, so the um, GTV is gonna cover the vertebral body, the lamina, and then right here, and then um, you wonder what the CTV is going to be. So let's just take this one, uh, one by one. So if it's the vertebral body and one pedicle, you cover the entire vertebral body, ipsilateral, ipsilateral pedicle, TP, and lamina. So entire vertebral body is gonna get covered, ipsilateral, TP, and lamina. If one lamina is involved, you cover the lamina, ipsilateral pedicle that's uh, already covered above. If the spinous process is involved, as it's uh, described here, you discover the spinous process and bilateral laminae. So now you're covering over here. And basically, if you follow this, the GTV ends up being this area here that's enhancing, and the CTV is essentially the entire vertebra. With the, Basically, they call this a donut because you leave a hole for the spinal cord. So it's important to describe where the tumor's going, if it's crossing midline in the vertebral body, if it's crossing midline in the lamina, because it'll help them define this. And then some disqualifications. Uh, we talked about leptomeningeal disease. Interdural extension of disease is important. You can use the same um, acute angle uh, concept that you use for um, pleural disease to, in the um, spinal canal. So this is a tumor that's gone into the epidural, uh, sorry, into the thecal sac. And there's basically no way of treating this cleanly because the, the uh, thecal sac is involved and uh, there's disseminated CSF. So if you just treat this, is futile, it's just gonna come back. LMD is obviously um, important. You can't just, you can't just say, oh, I'm just gonna treat this little nodule because all the stuff above and below is gonna grow back in. Uh, this is an imaging pitfall that we described a few years ago. Um, we had noticed that um, between pretreatment and immediate post-treatment MR, there's a, an apparent growth of the lesion and a lot of patients were being incorrectly classified as uh, having progressed uh, very rapidly. So the question was, is um, this difference progression or is it pseudoprogression? And um, we uh, followed a bunch of patients and noticed that 62% the tumor uh, decreased in size after therapy, but um, in about a third of the cases at three to six months, we didn't know if it was going to be progressing or pseudoprogressing. And um, ended up being a third of those patients who were apparently progressing at three to six months ended up going back down and being representative of pseudoprogression. Um, so, and these are just some diagrams from the paper showing the, the time course of these uh, lesions after SSRS. And we noticed that the pseudoprogression was only happening in patients um, with one fraction of stereotactic radiosurgery, which as I mentioned earlier, is the highest uh, biological dose. So we think this is some kind of edema tissue damage that's happening in the bone. Um, so the key here is um, you're going to see this. It's 14% after stereotactic radiosurgery. Um, in single fraction, it's a third of patients get this after single fraction. So having a higher thresher, threshold for calling true progression if your patients have gotten single fraction radiotherapy, stereotactic radiosurgery, sorry. Um, about a third of cases after, the, um, after SSRS on the three to six month follow-up scan. 
will have osseous progression. So be careful about the colon progression in the three to six month period after SSRIs. And um, obviously this is gonna be important for colon progression in clinical and also in trials. And then there's this concept of infield and marginal failure. So infield failure is relapsed encompassed entirely, with, entirely within the 95% isodose line. Basically that's the uh, GTV and maybe one of the um, isodose lines afterwards. And then marginal failure is outside of that. Marginal failure tends to happen earlier than infield, so just be aware um, of that difference. Uh, it'll help your pretest probability for calling one versus the other. Um, complications, as I mentioned earlier, are very low in SSRS. The, the main one we've seen is vertebral compression fracture. I personally have not seen spinal cord injury, esophageal injury, or bowel injury from SSRS. Um, and the um, fractures, symptomatic and asymptomatic, tend to happen most frequently within the first three months. So that first three-month scan after stereotactic radiosurgery is super exciting. You watch for osteocytal progression and uh, vertebral compression fractures. So what should you put in your report? These are the, um, this is the checklist. You talk about um, levels, make sure everything is um, kosher as far as the transitional anatomy. They need to know lytic, sclerotic, or mixed. This is for the SIN score, alignment, collapse, again, SIN score, extent of vertebral body involvement, posterior element involvement, extent of disease. This last one is to see if the patients are amenable uh, for stereotactic radiosurgery. Um, extent of epidural disease, including the Bilski score. This will tell them if they need to do separation surgery or um, lit or some other kind of um, uh, procedure. Um, disqualifying things like intradural uh, extent or leptomeningeal spread. On follow-up scans, make sure you dis differentiate between osteocytal progression and progressive disease. Basically, if it's within six months, it's really hard to tell, so you just recommend follow-up. Um, and then if, um, if you do see PD, is it inside the GTV or not? I've created this little macro in PowerScribe, basically, that gives the, um, the SIN score for um, the various things, and actually it does, ask, um, does act as a checklist for me to make sure I talk about all these things. Epidural disease and intradural disease aren't part of the SIN score, but I, I just put it all together because it helps with their surgical planning. And it just gives you a nice way of um, telling your, your colleagues in radiation oncology and surgery that you know what you're talking about. Okay, so um, in summary, I, we've reviewed the radiation therapeutic modalities available for spine mats, discussed indication for SSRS, reviewed the role of imaging and your report in discussing pitfalls and challenges, and then hopefully, as you go out into the world, you can, uh, if you're interested in procedures, you can look into this lit um, as adding some value for your patients and bringing in uh, some uh, business for your radiology department. These are the references and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Amini. I wanna thank both of our speakers today for two really wonderful talks. Um, if there are no questions at this time, then um, feel free to email us and we'll get uh, your answers back to you. And again, i um, so thankful to both speakers uh, for taking the time out of your very busy schedules uh, to speak today. And um, please join us on Thursday for our uh, next APDR session.